Imagination is more important than knowledge. For knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces the entire world, stimulates progresses, giving birth to evolution. This was said by Albert Einstein, a German scientist who lived in the first half of the last century. There was no better example to show he was right than with one of his own publications, The Special Theory of Relativity. This theory has everything to do with speed. So before I continue, I want you to think about this question. What is speed? Probably you will agree with me if I say that speed is the rate of which an object covers distance. But that's not fully true. Look at this car. Let's say that it travels with a speed of 60 km per hour. But that is when we refer me at the Earth. I can also refer me at the car itself. Now the car doesn't move at all. It is the Earth that is moving beneath the car with a speed of 60 km per hour. But I can also change my reference to the Sun. Now the speed of the car is 108,000 km per hour, or 30 km per second. As you can see, the speed of an object is not an established fact. But how about light? Light is an electromagnetic phenomenon that exhibits properties of both waves and particles. But that's quantum mechanics, for now I will focus on the wave behavior of it. As you probably know, waves move in a medium, sound waves move in air, and water waves move in water. But what is the medium of light? For a long time scientists had no idea what the so-called luminiferous ether could be, but it should be present in practically everything. Light is able to move through transparent substances and objects and through vacuum, but some other forms of electromagnetic radiation can penetrate into more dense stuff as well. Until 1887, when Albert Michelson and Edward Morley tried to demonstrate the ether wind with their interferometer. The ether wind should have been the sensible movement of the Earth through the omnipresent ether. Therefore, light that is moving back and forth in the east-west direction should have another travel time than light that is moving north-south. But Michelson and Morley found that in both directions the travel time of light is exactly the same. This was for many scientists a very unbelievable result. But for Einstein it was clear. The speed of light is independent of the condition of the environment. It's a universal constant. That is one of the two core statements of the special theory of relativity. The other one is that the laws of nature are the same in every situation. Let me introduce a few persons to you with whom I shall clarify what is meant by this theory. This is astronaut Jean-Luc. He is on his return from a journey to Venus. And this is James. He is coming back from Mars. Jean-Luc and James are both traveling with a speed of 20,000 meters per second towards the Earth. Jean-Luc sends a light signal towards James. The signal moves away from Jean-Luc's spaceship with exactly 299,792,458 meters per second. When the signal arrives at James' spaceship, it approaches with exactly the same speed despite the fact that Jean-Luc and James have a mutual speed difference of 40,000 meters per second. Maybe you will understand the logic of this a bit better when you take in mind what I said about speed before. How could you know whether it is the Earth that stands still, with Jean-Luc and James both approaching it with a speed of 20,000 meters per second? Or it is Jean-Luc's or James' spaceship that stands still, with the Earth approaching it at a speed of 20,000 meters per second, and the other spaceship with a speed of 40,000 meters per second. You can't. In every situation, all the circumstances are exactly the same. So also the speed of light should be the same in all the situations. And because the Earth and both of the spaceships have a theoretical probability of standing totally still, they will sense the speed of the light signal all the same. But that has big consequences for some other natural quantities. Let's do a mind experiment to show what I mean. Consider a simple clock consisting of two mirrors between which a light pulse is bouncing. This clock ticks once each time the light pulse hits either of the mirrors. 
Let's say that this clock is on board of Jean-Luc's spaceship. Jean-Luc will see the clock ticking in a certain time interval. At a certain moment, James' spaceship passes by. James can see Jean-Luc's mirror clock. James is moving with a certain speed relative to Jean-Luc. In other words, Jean-Luc's mirror clock is moving with a certain speed relative to James. So from James' perspective, the light pulse is moving in a horizontal component as well. Therefore, the distance to be covered by the light pulse is bigger than in James' perspective. But wait a minute. The light pulse moves with the same speed in both James' and Jean-Luc's perspective. That means that in James' perspective, it takes more time for the light pulse to move from one mirror to the other. James sees Jean-Luc's mirror clock ticking slower. Actually, James sees everything on board of Jean-Luc's spaceship in slow motion. This phenomenon is called time dilatation. We can go a step further. Let's say that James' spaceship follows another spaceship and is followed by a third ship as well. James beams a light pulse toward both other ships at the same moment when Jean-Luc passes by. From James' perspective, the other ships are standing still because they move with the same speed as James' ship. So James sees the light pulses arrive at the other ships at exactly the same moment. But from Jean-Luc's perspective, the spaceships are not standing still. But the speed of the light pulses is still the same as from James' perspective. So Jean-Luc sees the light pulse towards the rear ship arrive earlier as the light pulse towards the front ship. For James, the arrivals of the light pulses are simultaneous, but for Jean-Luc they are not. For Jean-Luc, the time on the rear ship is running ahead of the time on the front ship. After all, the time on both of the front and the rear ship is the same, but for Jean-Luc, events on the rear ship happen earlier than events on the front ship. At a certain moment, the three lined spaceships accelerate. From James' perspective, nothing happens. The distance between the ships stays the same. But Jean-Luc sees the rear ship accelerate earlier than James' ship, which accelerates at his point earlier than the front ship. So Jean-Luc will see the spaceships getting closer to each other. This phenomenon is called length contraction. It also happens with single objects. Jean-Luc sees James' spaceship become shorter when it accelerates. And in reverse, James sees Jean-Luc's spaceship become shorter from his perspective. Let's say that James' spaceship will continue accelerating with almost infinite engine power. When James' spaceship approaches the speed of light, both time dilatation and length contraction will assume extreme values. From James' perspective, time outside the ship will go slower and slower until it eventually freezes at the speed of light. Likewise, the length of the passing universe will become shorter and shorter until in the end there is no distance anymore. The entire universe has been flattened into one single slice. At that moment, James will be at all places in his direction of movement over the entire universe at once. And that single moment will continue forever. That is why it is impossible to move faster than the speed of light. For time cannot go slower than standing still, and space cannot be shorter than zero. And it means that if you will travel through space with almost the speed of light, you can cover many light years in just a few hours. Well, as seen from your perspective. Because if you return to Earth, thousands of years will have passed by. But that's general relativity, I will talk about it another time. Einstein was a bit wrong. Imagination doesn't embrace the entire world, it embraces the entire universe. Thanks for watching.